Okay, here we are with another New Zealand aviation podcast, sort of global aviation from the perspective of this part of the world, including Australia. And uh, Martin, welcome back. Uh, you are uh, still in Brisbane, I take it? I'm in Brisbane now, yeah, in the city, yeah. Um, you must be looking across the border to Victoria with wonderment right now. It's like a, a different country, a different political system, uh, different freedoms to the population apply there compared to where you are. It's crazy time, upside down world. Yeah, yeah. Victoria started going a bit crazy last week. Yeah. And so they've implemented their uh, their version of stage four. Um, again, Brisbane seems to be relatively ineffective, unaffected. There's a little, bit of a scare earlier in the week where some woman in Ipswich tested positive and then they retested and discovered it was a false positive and she doesn't actually have anything at all. So they're all happy about that. And then of course the week before were those girls that had been on their, um, allegedly on their shoplifting trip to Bris to Melbourne. Um, they went, they went down with it and, but we haven't really heard anything more about that. There's, um, there's lots of talk of slamming the borders shut and, and, and all of this. You'd, you'd think there's an election soon. But um, they have they have reimposed border controls uh, um, and 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 have sort of shut the borders. Pretty porous though, pretty porous. And you know the stage four in 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 Melbourne, it's yeah okay. But again, there's lots of lots of loopholes. I mean, I was speaking to a company down there this week, and they said yeah, it's affecting them, but they're still trading. What they they run a warehouse, and they've they've gone to click and collect, but everyone's still at work and all this type of thing and um the, you know the major the major inconvenience is the is the um, night curfew that even some of the people i spoke to in victoria they said you're gonna have a shutdown have a proper shutdown but this you know, you know they're letting people a few people onto building sites they're letting 66 percent of the people at any meat processing works go to work um yeah it's it's mm. compulsory <laughs> mask wearing I think a one kilometer um, uh, roaming distance allowed uh, around, or oh, is it five, is it? Okay, yeah. um, a, a nighttime curfew. Doesn't sound yeah. like a free country to me. No, no, but they're already saying that a lot of people, there was a, a report this morning, and I, I don't know whether it's true or not, but they are saying that it's proving very, very hard to police. And, and in times like this, it's not, not a free country. You, 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 you know, they've passed that law um public uh, i wouldn't be uh, surprised if there is a huge exodus out of the state after this is over well that's that's exactly what happened that's exactly the moment they announced it you know there were huge traffic jams at the border as as people tried to head north to get out of to get out of, especially into queensland a lot of people tried to get into queensland yeah, yeah. well uh, remains to be seen but uh uh, it's, you know, it's the same old sort of spooked out mentality. I see that uh, Sky News Australia, quite a few clips come through from that network to here. Looking at that, they they don't seem to be uh, supporting it. And um, uh, Alan Jones is very uh, vocal um, against how this is being handled. He's not a fan of uh, Daniel Andrews. He's premier, right? Who um, not not many people are fans of Big Plan Dan at the moment. Yeah, because of course that, there's all that um, relationship with uh, China Belt and Road and all that sort of stuff. So who who's up who and who's not paying? No one really knows. But um, it seems that the uh, daily figures are a yo-yo, basically. What what upset people about Dan is um, that they had one shut down and they feel that it's been bungled. Anyway, let's get into aviation and uh, nothing ever stops. And as a um, consequence of this COVID situation, there's been an air crash in India. Um, I'll bring up, we'll share the story, shall we? So here's the story. This is a um, whole, whole bunch of stories. This is New York Times. Uh, 18 killed. They're blaming it, as you see the headline there, on the pilot and the hilltop runway. And if you can see, it's one of those you know, leveled mm. off hills. I think it's a 35 meter drop. You see the, it's only a one and a half year old 73800s broken uh, into two pieces. The cockpits have uh, um, been slung along and apparently both pilots were killed. Uh, but uh, according to the information they have here, and I'm sure people have been looking at this, um, uh, they landed uh, in the city of uh, Kozikode and um, it was uh, raining 
Um, apparently, it was the second Air India Express flight 1344 approach um, to the uh, runway. Landed, I think, uh, in the information you've seen late, right? Hmm. Hmm. And then probably, probably aqua, aqua planed, full braking, skidded off the end. And probably if there was an overrun, everyone would be all right. Yes. Just scroll down a bit. It says, with visibility so bad, he radioed the control tower to switch runways. And let's see what the answer was to that. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, he radioed the control, switch runways, second attempt at landing Friday night. He apparently hit runway 102 late, more than half a mile into the 1.6 mile strip. Oh, tailwind. Mm. Mm. Um, and uh, apparently it says here that uh, people had warned against those conditions and making that uh, runway dangerous before. Kind of reminds me of Wellington. Obviously mm. not the same sort of drop, but in an overrun, you would have been smashed to pieces like that. It wouldn't have been good. Thankfully, that never happened. But they were returning um, people uh, from Dubai, um, repatriating um, due to COVID. So, um, mm. yeah, just a, another one of the... Um, Worst of all world situation, long on the landing, tailwind, heavy rain. In Wellington, you're always very lucky and there's generally never less than a light 30 knot breeze to yeah. help. So your ground speed's low. Yeah. Put in a tailwind though, eh? even, even like a five, seven, 10 knot tailwind can make a huge difference. Oh, yeah. Very, yeah, it doesn't take much at all, yeah. Um, there haven't been that many incidents lately and I guess that's because, <coughs> excuse me. No one's flying. There's a lot less flights. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, 18 killed and apparently some quite bad uh, spinal injuries. So you can imagine the deceleration down that bank was pretty traumatic. Yeah. Would have been, eh? Uh, pilot was a, a former um, military fighter pilot, Indian Air Force, I uh, said. But, I mean, you're going to get a lot of those, those guys coming out of the Air Force will go to civilian flying. So, yeah. Um, so that's sad. Condolences to everybody. Um, uh, here at home, it was reported that Air New Zealand's um, cancelled the lease and sent back two triple seven three hundred ERs to the desert, so they've gone. Yeah. So they're slowly, um, you know, parking them up. And Qantas are putting seven eight sevens in the desert as well. I saw. Getting rid of most of their seven eight sevens for and and for not less than twelve months, apparently. <coughs> really. Yeah. Well, yeah. um, I mean, if they're not doing any international flying, that's what's going to happen. Um, and Virgin, Virgin's announced that they're getting rid of all their long-haul aircraft, the A330s and the 777s, all of them are going. Really? And they, they're getting rid of another 3,000 people. Oh, so they're just going to do domestic and local, regional? Domestic. Into the islands. Uh, oh. Yeah, to the islands in New Zealand, and there is some talk. They, they do want to um, continue with some of their um, Asian flights. To They're not going to do American that anymore, but they do want to open up Japan and places like this, and there are some questions to what aircraft they will. They'll either go back and get some 787s, which is very high on the list, but they don't know when that will be. And But there was some talk in one of the forums on late last week that they might even be considering the long-range A320, which... Or A321, which I find unlikely, given that they're an all Boeing fleet and always have been. But you never no, know. no, they've had they've had um, A320. Oh, they did in, a, in, in, per, in Western Australia, they had an A320 fleet. Yes. Yeah, and also they've operated A330s. Yes, they've they've had yeah, but but they've got rid of them now. They're all gone. Yeah, but they'll still have people they can call on and knowledge and infrastructure yeah. and, and those methods of handling and maintenance that that, that yeah. they can call. I mean, I, when you were talking about that, I was thinking A321, well, extra long range or whatever, Neo, yeah, yeah for sure. That would, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. But I think they, I mean, they don't know what they're doing at the moment. They first of all better get a public that wants to fly. Tiger Air gone. Gone, gone, yeah. Yep, so, um, so that's happened. Um, news in no particular order. Um, I see an Air New Zealand A320 was struck by lightning. Uh, Queenstown. In fact, I can bring up that story if we just That'd go. Be exciting, to... eh? What's that? That would be exciting. Yep, I'll just bring that up and we'll do another share screen. Here we go. Yeah, uh, diverted after lightning strike. Uh, let's bring up the story from Stuff. Do you really think that's an A320 uh, tail in that picture? <laughs> <laughs> they never get that right. Those the morons when it comes. 
to come see. Don't even. I mean, like I say, if you ha if you don't want to know what aircraft to put in the picture, put the right flyer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, 141 passengers on board diverted after plane was struck by lightning. NZ 615, Auckland to Queenstown, um, 9.30 yesterday morning, Saturday morning. Um, so, you know, it's not uncommon. I remember once uh, my sister used to work at maintenance for Air New Zealand. Um, they got a call at the hangar that a 73200 was coming in and uh, in from Queenstown. They'd been hit by lightning and thought that they might have taken a bit of damage. And she said they went and inspected it. And just above the eyebrow window, there was this little melted bit of metal. That was it. Where it had been struck, yeah. But it wasn't, it didn't need fixing or anything. It was just a little blemish. Also, I remember um, I flew around uh, in Australia with these ANSET guys for a week or so on a 727 freighter. RMX was the rego. And the guy, Jeff, the um, captain, said they got, um, struck by lightning, landing at Perth one morning, early in the morning, still dark, at about 100 feet. And they all were blinded. So he, he had to go, he, he sort of went around by feel for the first few seconds. Wow. Decided to abort the landing and they went around because none of them could see. It was so such a bright flash that they're all sort of temporarily kind of blinded. Flash blinded. <laughs> I mean, all sorts of things happen. So... Um, uh, it can be a little, you know, it can be a little frightening. There's a couple of really great videos. I remember one, I think it's a JAL or ANA 74 climbing up from Haneda or something, getting this huge strike, you know, sort of uh, up the top and then sort of exiting out the bottom of the plane, this perfectly captured lightning strike. But they have... My, my, my dad was on a uh, SAA um, 707 in the um, mid 70s and they were overflying Madagascar and the, the plane got struck by lightning and they were actually without cabin power for about 20 minutes. Wow. Yeah. Blew all the circuit breakers or something like that. Yeah. So they just sat there in the dark. Yeah. 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 Wasn't that uh, one of the issues that uh, Boeing was having with their 787s you were saying? And the, well, they've the removed a lot of lightning protection. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's the story with the 777X? I see their fourth aircraft. I think it's the fourth aircraft is flying or just flew in the last few days. Um, I've got to say, it's pretty impressive looking aircraft. It's massive. I'm wondering if it's actually too big for the market now. But anyway, um, um, everyone's delayed on deliveries. Uh, I haven't really yeah. been keeping an eye except on headlines. Have you been following that? Well, they're delaying. It looks like they're delaying... Um entry into service until 2022. Wow. Yeah, so it won't be next year either. And that was when they, they had that, um, with the um, uh, stress test, it blew a hole in the side, didn't it? Just... Well, that was one issue, but they, they, you know, they're not, they, they hadn't really been much talk about to what extent that affected the program. They had a lot of, or apparently they had a lot of issues with the general electric engine that needed a bit of work. And now they've got issues with nobody wants to fly anywhere, which is actually by far the biggest. Yeah, and that could be um, quite a while and and, and yeah. uh, take a long time to resolve, you know, um, uh, over time, back to the numbers that we're used to. Yeah, no, but nobody nobody wants them. God. So I guess it's better time. to delay it now before they've built them than to um, build them all up and have them lying around in a field while you argue about who's not going to pay for them. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's certain um, entities are hemorrhaging cash. Um, yes. Uh, and it looks like A380s are all... There's been, been some really great pictures um, going around. I might in post-production cut in a few of, you know, hot, entire fleets of A380s parked up, like the Qatar ones all in a row. Um, huge numbers, obviously, of Emirates. At, I think that secondary airport they have at Dubai, they've sort of filled that up there. Though Tim Clark, yeah. I see even in the last week, head of um, Emirates, uh, managing director or whatever. Um, so Tim Clark is saying, you know, we're sticking with them. The, they're yes. not letting them go anywhere. No. No, he's going for it. And he kind yeah. of sounded disappointed they were stopping making them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, they, they, they have very successfully made a lot of money out of it, haven't they? Well, surely with the others being retired, they can cherry pick and add to their fleet if they want to later on or change out the older ones and still bring in relatively low hour machines. I wonder if they'll do that, yeah. What do you think? Do you think Qantas will bring them back? 
I th- uh, yeah, I mean, by all, for, for everything I've heard, Qantas is really happy with them, and they move a lot of people very long distances relatively cheaply. So, yeah, they they um, they didn't take any more of them, but the ones they've got, they're happy enough with. I've ne- you know, as as we've discussed on this program before, we've never really understood, you know, some of the some of the marketing around it. For example, Korean Air operated their A three eighty with less seats than they had on their seven four sevens. Yeah. That? You know, well, they so must they put have had the, premium customers for, the, for, for those seats. And I think that's the issue. So Singapore Airlines, um, they said they made the most money on their A380 flights to Zurich that were crammed full of premium passengers, right? Wow. But if you try to emulate that, but that's Zurich. Because, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of money go to Zurich. But, you know, Korean trying to, maybe they thought, oh, well, we'll you know, we'll put a couple of million dollars worth of premium seats into the plane and hopefully, and it just didn't happen. But that doesn't mean you couldn't then put 680 seats or 700 seats well, in it. And, you we've know. always wondered why people don't do that. I think Emirates yeah. have up to 600 seats in theirs. Yeah, and no, I think they have a bit more than that. I think it's more close to 650. Wow. Yeah, and I think um, there's another airline that's also pumped a few few more seats into it. It's not the, yeah. um, the, the that charter airline in, in Spain. Oh, I fly. Yeah, they, they definitely have. Yeah, but there's someone else that's got a high density, a relatively high density. But anyway, yes, yeah. it's it's it's. Um, I wonder whether I wonder whether Tim Clark will, will buy secondhand ones. And they'll be cheap. They will be dirt cheap. Yeah, and and maybe he can give them some of his um, deferred triple seven Xs. Yeah, so yeah. they're obviously planning to carry on the the model um, that they. Have have set up. They're not they're obviously going to trim it back, but he, he's he's going for high frequency, large capacity. He has to, though, doesn't he? I mean, Dubai, in terms of you know, it's a one trick pony. That, that either works or you get out of the airline business. Yeah, haven't heard too much about the state of the uh, airlines in America. There hasn't been too much news there. Yeah, I think we'll 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 wait for the um, quarterly results and and work out which ones are going to go bankrupt or go into <laughs> check. Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection because uh, they are. Okay. Well, speaking of bankruptcy protection, I can bring this story up. Um, let's um, let's do another screen share. If you just bear bear with me for one moment, we're going to do that now. This one and share. Virgin Atlantic um, yeah. is warning that they're running out of money and uh, going to be filing for bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, so what does it say here? Um, could, uh, could run out of cash next month if creditors do not approve a $1.2 billion rescue deal. Um, again, I mean, they were doing pretty well, Virgin Atlantic. I think, you know, consistently well. Um, they are, if anyone's going to be a victim of this, they are. Cause most of it was leisure passengers, wasn't it? To leisure. Well, leisure and, and, and a fair bit of business to the major cities in the States. That That's right. where Virgin... So. So now that um, North America is essentially cut off, or Europe's essentially cut off from North America, because there's, I mean, America's basically no countries accepting them without two weeks quarantine, that, that money tap got turned off. And I believe that Virgin Atlantic has actually filed for bankruptcy, and, or certainly in America, they've gone for- uh, Filed for bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy protection for its United States business. There you go, yeah. Um, filed for chapter 15 bankruptcy in the Southern District of New York, Mm. Um, uh, it, uh, well, people can probably read this. I'm sort of reading it as well, but, uh, it lets them restructure, um, I guess, um, debt and, uh, their relationships with creditors. Just looking at this picture here, why, why are they removing individual window frames out of the 747, do you think? I have no idea. I mean, what do they do? Plug them back in somewhere else? There must be. There must be a market for window surrounds. I thought the same thing. You know, they're, they're, yeah. and they're beautifully cut out, and it's the whole panel around the window, and, and maybe that's a, yeah, a highly sought after spare part. I don't know when that plane came out of its check, so maybe, maybe they get, maybe they got replaced, and they're good enough to be used somewhere else. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, kind of weird. Yeah, because quite often you'll see pictures of wrecked planes, and they've had the whole door assembly removed. Yeah, um, and I guess they just splice back in somewhere. Mm. I'll mm. stop the share again and we'll go back to the screen. There we go. So, um, yeah, but it's still a, I, I still think Virgin's a kind of a tired brand, but maybe in the uh, areas where they've got their business, they're, they're not perceived that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
on a knife edge. Branson was, come... um, Virgin Galactic was talking about a new supersonic aircraft. Do you see that? Yeah, but one thing you notice about the Virgin brand, and I don't know whether it's Branson or the brand, every time somebody talks to something really cool that they might like to do, not, not within two or three weeks, you'll see a Virgin branded at the same thing. Being right. Shown. I think it's you just know. like a, a PR sort of, uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. you know, they've got their space flight thing. They've got their, now they've got their Mark three supersonic jet, which, you know, there was, there's that other company, I don't know, us based company that's been talking that up for a while now. Now they, it looks like they've slapped some version stickers on the side of it. And uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to share the, um, here it is here. Mac three. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Mini um, mini Concorde. See, there's no, there's very little. Um, I don't know how many seats it's got, but it doesn't look like many. It's only got about ten windows. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would uh, well, that's for the very wealthy, isn't it? So, mm. it, to the average person, it really means nothing. It's interesting how that supersonic thing died. Well, there's a very complicated diagram that I saw. And I've actually looked for it again, and I've never found it. But um, some guy took all the timetables and applied Mark II to them. And there's actually very few markets where it works, where you don't leave, either leave at a crazy time of the night or early morning, or arrive at a crazy time right. of the night or early morning. <clears throat> it, it worked really well on the transatlantic. Yeah. yeah. But so, anywhere so, else, so subsonic is about right for making timetables or arrival times and, and and the departure and arrival times making any sort of sense. Well, you've, you've either, you've either got to go a little bit slower subsonic, or you've got to go a whole heap faster. Yeah, well, that's not going what, to happen. Which is what Elon Musk says with his, um, with his uh, putting 150 people in those rockets and hopping them around the world. So you get from, um, you know, what did he say? You get from Singapore to London in, in, in an hour and 12 minutes or something the, crazy. The, now you're talking. Um, we'll look at the Star Hopper in a moment. Yeah. Um, and also, of course, the um, return to Earth of the uh, Crew Dragon capsule was pretty impressive. Yeah. And I, I like the recovery method. You know, back in the day for Apollo, it was aircraft carriers and um, key uh, seeking helicopters and the whole nine yards. This is just like a, a converted fishing trawler that just has a little yeah. crane on the back, lifts it up, puts it in a little, little, little sort of cradle, and then that's it, you know. And they and they dropped it off the coast of Pensacola, you know. It wasn't out in the open ocean. No, it wasn't in the middle of nowhere. No. So they were swamped by um, um, recreational boaters and their speedboats. Yeah, I saw them all speeding towards it. Yeah, it's a pretty yeah. pretty cool thing. A lot more sort of down down to earth. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but the whole they, thing they, worked, they, worked fine. Yeah, yeah, and they got it. I mean, that's the thing. It really wasn't far off the coast. That was, which is amazing, and it and it all worked. It all worked amazingly well. And great footage coverage of it um, coming in um, on. You could see, you know, the thing streaking across the sky. What's 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 also interesting? So I think that landed on the. Did that land on the Monday? I can't even remember. But yeah. it's got so routine because that landed. Then they sent their crew, they sent their space hopper up for a 150 meter hop. And then on, I think Wednesday or Thursday, they launched another Falcon yeah. 9 with 58. And, and you know, I love watching the takeoff, especially the booster landing. Yeah. But it's just so routine. It's just like, oh, oh. oh yeah, Falcon, yeah, SpaceX has launched another one. Okay, whoopie do. Uh, I saw Elon Musk's speech after the um, arrival of the, the crew dragon thing. And. Um, he was quite, he was kind of over, overwhelmed. He, he said it'd taken 18 years from him first thinking, okay, well, if I got all these ideas and the only person that's going to do it is me to actually getting that done. Hmm. It's not very long, you know. No, it's not. It's not. And it's, it's, I mean, it really is. It really is interesting that, that when, I mean, you got to say it, you know, when the 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 uh, the military industrial slash government complex was in charge of things, it took forever. It was ruinously expensive, and and nothing ever really changed. Is that these guys come along and bang, 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 bang? They're just yeah. hammering it. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, it's the same thing with the with with the electric cars. 
Yeah, it, it, we, 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 I believe, we, we're, not just I believe, but lots of people believe, we're, we're driving around now with all these gas-powered cars. I drive around in my old ute, and, and I'm thinking, you know, th th this won't be happening in five or six years. They'll all be gone. Yeah. Maybe not in Australia, because Australia is genuinely fighting a rearguard action against electric vehicles. They're pretty much doing whatever they can to make sure that they don't. But it's 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 a it's a lost battle. It, it, don't worry about that. But it's it's we are witnessing. You know, this would be like you know being in in, in 1903 with all the horses everywhere, and it was you know they say it's less than five years. There were no horses. It just it goes back quickly. Uh, someone I heard someone say the other day on one of the media that they didn't think that anyone born today would ever drive a car. Yeah, or well, certainly not a, a gas powered car. Well, no, the, the, they'll just be autonomous. They'll, they'll be so yeah. regular that most people will just not even see the need to learn how to physically drive a car. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Possibly. It's, it's, um, while you're talking it's space there, saying, oh, sorry? It's that saying that I like, and, it, and, and it's been attributed to some Saudi oil minister back in the 70s or 80s, where he said the, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Yeah, I like that saying. That's a good saying. It's a really yeah. good saying. And it's the same thing. You know, the, 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 we, we didn't run out of fuel. We'll never run out of food. But something better will come along and we'll just do that. And that'll be the end of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't and run out of steam. Happening. Um, yeah. uh, I was um, um, quite interested. I'm going to share this screen this week to find out a bit about um, this thing. The um, Russian <clears throat> moon rocket, equivalent to the Saturn. The N1. And that thing, that thing it, it was bigger than the Saturn. It had three million pounds more thrust, but the four of them just blew up. And one of them yeah. was the biggest ever. ever. Um, uh, I don't know. It was, it was just a massive explosion. Destroyed the launch pad and everything like that. It had, I think, um, uh, over 30 engines. Um to power it. Um, I think the last flight, they could have actually, uh, and, and the way it was designed was if there was an engine failure, the engine um, diagonal would shut down. Yes. So it maintained symmetrical thrust. Yes. And they had a problem um, in the final part of the first stage burn on the last launch of this thing. And um, I, I don't know, the, the, they bungled the shutdown of the, the couple of engines failed. They bungled it. If they had uh, done it right, it would have, would have got up there it probably would have worked so but uh, i think they knew after that that they'd lost the race to the americans but this is one huge huge hugely powerful rocket and and you know it all comes down to material science and all that type of thing that enables these things That's musk right. wouldn't have been able to do it without really cheap, fast accelerometers that were probably developed for the cell phone industry or cheap GPS receivers and all this positioning and, and all these fast acting, very clever electronics. Those guys, the Russians are doing it with all analog computers and homemade sensors. Yeah. It was, it was hard. And of yeah. course that laid the foundation for, you know, for things to come. But yeah, the, the, the Musk is very, very lucky. Of course he's made a lot of his own luck. And he's, he's honestly done, or I believe, most of it himself. But the, the, the environment, he, it's typical, you know, they, they, what do they say? Stand on the shoulders of giants. He's, he's, yeah. he's in, in the right time at the, with the right, or certainly with the right motivation. Let's just, let's just see how this comes across. I'm going to share this because it's, 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 it's only, it's a minute long, I think. Here we go. Look at that thing. And that's just one engine, right? Yeah, it's um, it's it's when you see that footage initially, it's hard to understand the size of that thing. 
Mm. It's it's not small. It's really big. 50 meters. Yeah. 165 feet. And that's not the whole length, is it? It won't be the whole length of the whole thing. Mm. So when, 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 because there's another bit that goes on the top of that. So that's, that's a prototype, a prototype of the booster, which will lift the actual starship into, into orbit. Yeah. Incredible. And they can both land again, coming back. Yeah. They both come back down, even the starship. So that's, that's going to be interesting because, you know, at the moment, Musk's bought a, or SpaceX has bought a capsule back from 17,500 miles or whatever the orbital speed is. He's never actually bought a large spacecraft back, but the Starship, the, the bit that goes on top of that, it's going to come back in through the atmosphere and it's not going to have an ablative coating or anything. It's just going to be stainless steel. Wow. And, and is well, it going to use rocketry to slow the, the deceleration throughout? It, it, yeah, so it'll, it'll come in backwards and, and, and massively slow itself down, sure. And then it'll flip over and it's got those two fins, which it'll use to yeah. um, vary a- angle and attitude. And then it'll come down, but then it's going to land vertically again. With those little feet. Yeah. Yeah, so it'll come in with those canards. It'll, it'll, it'll come down and then it'll change it. And then the rocket will fire and it'll... I mean, I've got to see it before I actually believe it's going to happen. But don't be surprised if in the next year or two he's actually doing it. Well, he said in that speech um, last week after the capsule came back, this means the moon's on, and when the moon's on, Mars is on. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, he's, he's, he's actually spoken about that. If you're going to the moon or going to the Mars, going to the Mars, it's, it's yeah, you, you've solved 80% of the problem once you get to the moon. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, so really, really cool. Um, and um, a fine example of someone who says they'll do something and it gets done. Yes, yes. And, and it's I mean, successful. I know, I, I know I could do with a bit more of that. And um, I, I, all our governments, all of our governments could do with a whole lot more of that. Well, I think personally, New Zealand should be talking to Musk and trying to be in on these projects because, I mean, we're already launching um, rockets, you know, so... Yeah, and they're great. And and what I like about the electron rockets is he's using he's not using traditional turbo pumps. In the, he's using electric motors. Yeah, to power the rockets. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if the prototypes came out of a Dyson vacuum cleaner. <laughs> you dry your hands. <laughs> yeah, because well, they're a very good high speed motor, and there's all sorts of videos on YouTube of people putting those Dyson vacuum motors into their diesel trucks and acting as electric turbochargers. Wow. And they work. Mm. That's how they build up a lot of pressure. Probably not enough for a rocket engine, but anyway. Um, one thing I want to say, if if we're pressed for time, um, the whole 737 MAX MCAS system, it has a, a precedence in history, and that was the reason that the British CAA forced Boeing to add another 40 inches to the fin of the 707 before ah. Britain would, would certify it. And they made them put those strakes on. And it turns out that Boeing then uh, added those, the 40 inches of, on the fin to all Boeings. And yeah. the reason the FAA or the CAA, the British CAA, made them do it is because they said in certain situations, directional stability on their aircraft was very, very difficult, especially during any overpitch maneuvers. Ah. Yeah. And and the guy, the guy who was talking about it said... Um, the, the, the Boeing put a lot of pressure onto the American FAA, which then put pressure onto the CAA to try and force the POMs to pass it. Right. And they just would and, and for people who are interested in, in, in that type of thing, um, there is a really interesting resource that somebody on the interwebs put me onto. It is the website of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Mm-hmm. And they've got all these podcasts on there. Wow. And, yeah, you see, so you've got the, the, the DP Davies interview on testing comets, Boeing 707, Britannia, right. et, cetera, et cetera. And he's got a, there's a lot of stuff like this. And so, you know, the DP interviews on the, on the Concorde and the V bombers, on his service in the fleet air arm and handling squadron during the 1940s, all that. It's, it's really, really good. Trident VC 10, back 111, and the Boeing 727. Worth a listen. Worth yeah, a listen. Yeah, for sure. No, I'll be, I'll be in there. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd heard about that because yes, there's that um, fin under the um, empennage of the um, or the rear part yeah. of the fuselage too that they put on the seven O's, and also that stopped over rotation. Without yes. I read somewhere that without the leading edge slats on the uh, early wing, 
and the way the flaps work, the Royal Aeronautical that it was, Society. it was quite easy if you were heavy to over rotate. It was, it was. And um, that had been a constant issue with the, um, well, not a constant issue, but it had been an issue which had first arisen with the comet. And so the British were quite sensitive to it. And that's what led Boeing to, to eventually come up to these um, certification tests where they'd scrape the aircraft yeah. down the runway on the tail and it could still get off without... Minimum unstick. Yes. Yes, that's a direct result of, of, of the British refusing to take the 707. Well, that was bold of the, the palms, and they, that was hard won IP that they were working off for sure. Like you <clears throat> said, uh, yeah. there were like some tail scrapes in the comets, right? The comet. Uh, the comet yeah, one. and near stalls and, and all this type of thing, because it would over rotate on the takeoff and then, and, and then lose it. Um, I think uh, for the 707, it changed pretty well when the, with the, you know, the big 300 with the full length, you know, Kruger flaps, leading edge slats. Yeah. The, uh, the lift went further forward on the wing. Yes. And yes. they got off without so much of a rotation angle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I saw, saw a video <clears throat> um, and it had a, a mock-up model of the 737 MAX undercarriage. And it actually, um, when it's extended, it's longer than the, um, the earlier 737 models. But when it um, retracts, it, it, it sort of uh, shortens its length. It goes up system. into the... Yeah. It's quite a clever little mechanism. Another way they've got around the clearance problem. Yes. Yeah, not as, not as clever as designing a, a, a new aircraft, which would see them <laughs> for the next 50 years, but, but clever nonetheless. Well, another story. Another story. <laughs> um, yeah. Before we uh, end, a quick uh, Bring Our Birds uh, Home update uh, for people who wonder, getting around the owners all the time, real problem traveling anywhere near Brazil at the moment, real problem. Uh, yes. North Carolina, where the seven three is, we're talking to a few people. Uh, hopefully, can say more about this soon. There's some people who are really keen to support that. But again, travel coming back three thousand dollar fee to quarantine if you're not, um, you know, an expat returning from overseas. If you're going for any temporary period of time, though they say there are dispensations. It's kind of a lot of money just to go somewhere. Uh, it's more expensive almost to uh, come back here and spend two weeks in quarantine than all your travel and accommodation uh, over there. But uh, th that's all um, uh, sort of in a holding pattern, but <clears throat> uh, we're not going backwards. Though we are putting together a range of merchandise. I've got a designer working on um, the T-shirt um, graphics, uh, caps, mugs, pins, shopping bags even. Um, there's a whole lot of things you can do these days. And I'll be putting up some of those designs soon to um, see what people think about them on the Bring Our Birds Home uh, page. I thought um, I made an executive decision, Martin. I thought that we would uh, um, choose a slightly uh, different aircraft of the uh, week or the podcast. And I'm going to, again, do the share screen. And uh, the reason I chose this aircraft, I watched quite a good doco on YouTube about a crash of one of these aircraft, a British Midland service in the late 60s near Manchester, the Canadair North Star. Now, I, I was aware of this aircraft. I think BOAC used to call them the Argonauts. Basically, uh, ba based on the DC-4 airframe, fundamental airframe, it's uh, Canadian development of that uh, aircraft. And instead of, I think they had Pratt & Whitney's on originally, didn't they? They put Rolls-Royce V-12 Merlin engines on these aircraft. And I think the DC-4 wasn't pressurized, but even though I've tried to find some confirmational information, the way they talk about the description of the aircraft as there being a non-pressurized version indicates there might have been a pressurized um, version. But the interesting thing is the difference in performance. Uh, the DC-4 cruised to 227 miles per hour, but uh, the uh, Canada and North Star, um, 325 miles an hour. So, man, did it get along faster? She got along Yep, and had a hell of a range, nearly 4,000 miles. What a great performing aircraft. That is pretty good, eh? Here's a picture of it. Um, oh, no, that's the DC-4, right? That's, there's the DC-4. There's the, um, the Argonaut. So um, if you didn't know kind of what you're looking for, you might think it was a DC-4 first off. But uh, no, it was um, uh, this uh, Canada version. And... Uh, Famous for carrying the royal family on a couple of trips. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, the uh, Trans Canada Airlines put out the original spec for it. 
um, and uh, also operated by Canadian Pacific Airlines, and of course, BOAC. I think BOAC hung, a lot, uh, uh, hung on to a lot of those piston aircraft a bit longer than they otherwise would because when the Comets were withdrawn, they had to bring them back in or keep them in service to fill the gaps. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, I've, I've watched a few YouTube videos of that Argonaut thing, and it basically had four fighter engines on the wings. Yeah. And they had ejector ejector exhaust, right? They didn't they didn't they didn't collect the exhaust and because you know those old ra oh, those radials had a, an exhaust ring. Right. So the ma the major complaint about the Canadair was the noise because you those in those inboard engines you, you you had been sitting twenty feet from a roaring Merlin engine with ejector stub exhaust. It would have been incredibly loud. Yeah incredibly loud um, there, there was some uh, talk uh, on the wiki page there <clears throat> of the efforts to um, uh, to uh, lower the noise levels you know from I think 102 decibels to 95 is what they got <laughs> um, I'm sharing are you seeing that uh, hang on yeah, you, that's, uh, that's the Queen Mother getting on I think uh, Canadian um, Air Force Canadair um, bore to you know go on a on a tour somewhere, why, but that's how she looked. That's why Prince Charles will never be king. You know that. Why? Because you can say, "Where is the Queen Mother?" You can't say, "Where's the King Mother?" <laughs> Doesn't sound right, does it? No. Um, <laughs> the uh, crash, the British Midland crash, is an interesting one. Uh, we'll go. We'll go back to the uh, share screen. Oh. You got something going on there? Do we? we? Oh, wait on. I know what's happening. I know what's happening. It's uh, it's YouTube uh, <clears throat> carrying on when um, I didn't think I told it to carry on. Um, okay. The crash that um that I was reading about was I mean there have been a few but the one I was reading about was in oh sixty seven. Uh, British Midlands uh, Airways crashed uh, uh, near Stockport, Stockport, Greater Manchester, United Kingdom. 72 died in the crash, <clears throat> 12 seriously injured. And what happened, it was a um, um, one of those uh, sort of weird um, sort of gotcha moments where the four fuel cross-flow valve handles, which are in forward, I think, of the uh, uh, engine throttles, were not clearly seen from the pilot's position. So they couldn't see the thing was an actual detent. And it turned out that one of them was a quarter of an inch out and without the crew knowing, was pumping fuel out of a tank that supplied uh, engine number, I think how it worked, engine number three. But as it turned out, the um, engine um, uh, wiring to the gauges was plugged around the wrong way. So they had, engine four, uh, engine three starve of fuel, but they thought it was engine four. So shut down engine four, feathered it, but engine three remained not going, but windmilling, so a huge drag. And uh, they're approaching the um, uh, Manchester airport. And obviously they, they didn't know what was going on, going on. They couldn't work out what was going on. Mm. Uh, they tried to restart the exhausted engine because they, they thought that was the one that was affected. And uh, as it turned out in the end, the aircraft couldn't maintain altitude and it crashed onto the suburb six miles short of the Manchester runway. Uh, and it took a, a lot of investigation, um, you know, by flying uh, another aircraft with um, uh, test pilots on board and putting through a whole lot of things to find out that that's what happened, that a tank drained out and no one knew and, and that's what led to that. Uh, but it got me thinking too, because didn't, didn't a British Midland 73400 crashed um, yeah. in the UK back in the, it was the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And Depends that was also a, 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 an engine, wrong engine shut down because of cross wiring. Yeah, they shut down the wrong engine, yeah. And, the, and now the rule is, um, it, there's actually, apparently there's a rule. You've actually got to send someone down to have a look at the engine to make sure. Yeah. Well, I think right. it turned out also that Boeing had done a whole lot of weird wiring and bad quality control and there were other aircraft that, had gone out. That, I mean, that was a production error. Apparently, there was a test in in in, um, in <clears throat> early Airbus days where 
they'd ask one of the the in, um, technicians to to change one of the side stick controllers for some reason, and he took a side stick controller out of out of um, stores. Yeah, and the plug didn't fit, so he changed the plug. But what he didn't realize is they were plugged for left hand and right hand. Oh God! Right, and then he messed it up. He messed up the wiring, and he reversed the the left and right. Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but nothing happened. But it and and they 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 went through the series of steps that it took to actually do that, and the ingenuity showed to get that all to work was was you know. But up, but up that's crazy thinking. Yeah, but it happens, eh? Yeah, that's the thing, and um, and you get a compounded. You know, if if that wiring wasn't around the wrong way, though. It wouldn't have happened, you know. Um, it's it's kind of weird. Now we've just talked about an old prop liner, which and and then prior to that, I talked about uh, electric cars and and all that type of thing. And it it brings to mind something else I read recently, and because uh, I read books about um, aircraft engines and all this type of thing, because I, I I find particularly the last of the piston liners was super super interesting. Yeah, the amount of you know technology and everything they had in a mechanical technology, and. Um, some guy said, I forget his name, I don't think it was Gunston, but it was one of the guys who said, don't forget that way up until the late 60s, a well-sorted prop liner, might not have been as fast, might not have flown as high and everything, but a well-sorted prop liner was more reliable and more efficient than an early jet. He yeah. said there was no... And, and the reason Wright aircraft engines lost their, um, lost their lead, or they lost everything, is because um, they simply couldn't believe that something better than right and could come across. They just they just couldn't believe it because they said, "Well, look at them. They're rubbish. They burn too much fuel. They're loud. They're unreliable." They're and and I was thinking about that, and I think that's where we are today with the car industry because you know someone goes and buys, let's say they go and buy a new double cab Ute, right? They, let's say they've got a, a 2015 double cab Ute. And they say, oh, I want to go and get a new one. It's five years old. I want to go and get a new one. Basically, the only difference is it might have a cup holder in the back seat or a slightly different color. Mm. But fundamentally, <clears throat> we've reached peak car. They're, they're yeah. not changing. The price is going up. They're staying the same, and they all look the same. And, and you just know that at that point, it's all over. Yeah. Because people are just say, I'll see you later. It's done. That's what we're seeing now, do you think? We're at that level. I reckon, eh? I reckon. I mean, you must be seeing it in New Zealand. The, all those um, Japanese import Leafs and everything that they're bringing in. There must be, yeah. I mean, apparently there's more Japanese, there's more electric cars on the road in New Zealand than there are in Australia. Wow. And look at the difference yeah. in size. Yeah. 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 Well, all I notice being in Auckland is a uh, big uh, black um, um, uh, Audi, um, BMW, Volvo. Um, there's a, there's a, a list of them, uh, SUVs and station wagons and, and it, they're all black. Yeah, that's um, interesting. I, mean, here, I don't know why so that is. Here in Australia, when you do see a black car, it's 10 to 1 got a, a, a silver fern or something stuck on the back of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's a legacy of the sports thing. but Yeah. But anyway, yeah. so I think that's about it for the time being. We've yeah. sort of chewed the fat. I don't think we've missed any of the major, the major majors. There hasn't been any 737 Max news that I've seen. Well, um, they're talking of late Q4 for it to get back in the air, and they have released a list of changes they want made it, which includes wiring changes and, and training. So it looks like they will be paying that million dollars per aircraft back to Southwest Airlines, which might make them very happy. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, because it will require extra training. Go uh, yeah. Go well, they keep them as a customer. I, I, I reckon the smart money is on the um, A220 for so Southwest. Do I. So yeah, I. that would make a lot of sense. And if they ordered 200 of them, you know, that would um, get back on their feet in a smaller market with a more efficient aircraft. Um, yeah. uh, some of the pictures of the new Neos coming out and some of the liveries they're in, they, they look incredible, those A321 Neos. They do. They do. They, they, they look very cool. And that might be as the as the industry emerges from this sort of semi 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 shutdown. That might be the aircraft. I, w I wonder how many orders for regular A320, 321s, and I wonder how many. Yeah, you know, it's not good for the A330. Let's face it. it the, 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 the A350 might will will definitely still soldier on as the top of their range. But if you're an airline that was thinking of getting five or six new A330s, may not have been. I bet 
10 or 15 A320 in a range of XL, XXL, triple XL would make a, would be a very compelling thing at the moment. And Boeing ain't got no answer for that. No, uh, that's what I was thinking. Um, it's like, uh, you know, a green fields for Airbus. Yeah, it could well be. It could well be, especially with that aircraft. I mean, not, the A330. This might be. That might. This might knock it on the head. Maybe. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, that's pretty well it for now. Um, we've been a bit busy the last few weeks, so we'll try and keep up the frequency of these things as much as we can. Okay, time to wind it up. I must say, Martin, I did prefer the Roma backdrop with the Aussie bush and the big sky. So did I, but um, Roma was cold and monochromatic. It's so much greener. It's like when I came back down to Brisbane and I thought I'd arrived in New Zealand again, it was that green. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. Uh, in the meantime, until we meet again soon, Paul Brennan here in the bunker in Auckland. And <laughs> Martin Noakes in Oxley. Good old Oxley, mate. Oxley. And, uh, 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 and I hope you don't uh, have to go into lockdown. I hope so too. Yeah. Mind I you, that won't that. stop you doing this. No. No, it'll stop you earning money, which would be a bit of a bugger, but there you go. <laughs> Good luck there. Yeah. Hey, patrons. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll yeah. see you again soon. All right. Cheers.